welcome to Assemblies of God Great Britain. You're watching a recorded message from our National Conference 2022. Enjoy the message and for more great content, don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Now we're going to talk about This Is Us. And this is really a chance for us to share vision together, strategy, talk about the next six years, what it could potentially look like for us as a movement of churches. And then tomorrow we're going to talk about this is now, this is how, this is them. And uh, we have Pastor Agu joining us from Jesus House. Tonight we have uh, Amy or Irwin joining us as well. She's going to be doing an amazing session. This is them understanding the world that we're dealing with. We have as well J. John, the brilliant J. John with us who's going to be sharing. We're going to have an amazing time in breakouts tomorrow. So I hope you're ready to go, folks. Let's come with um, ears wide open to hear what God is saying. I, I, want to, I want to take a moment to commend all our bivocational pastors across our movement, of which we have so many. You are working full-time jobs and part-time jobs in order to pay your way through ministry. If you are a bivocational pastor, could you quickly stand to your feet in this room right now? Come on, let's put our hands together. Can we honour them? You are the heroes. You're amazing. We love and honour and respect you so much. Absolutely incredible. And uh, we also have a whole heap of chaplains and missionaries in here today. And uh, we're going to honour them. I'm going to get you to stand in a few moments time as well. And uh, what we're going to do in this session on vision is um, I want to take you forward. And in order to go forward, I want to take you back three years. Three years ago was our first chance to share vision with you, to share strategy with you. If you remember, there was a vote uh, about a month or so earlier. Uh, you voted in a new national leader, a new national team, and it gave us a month really to get together, to plan, to pray, to strategize, and to talk about what the next few years could look like. Who knew that coronavirus was around the corner? None of us knew that, did we? But we did spend some time and uh, we looked at three things effectively when it came to the movement. We talked about our past, our present and our future. And when it comes to the past, we talked about uh, having an honour culture and really honouring the past and setting us up for the future. When it came to the present, we were talking about some of our current realities. And when it came to the future, we began to strategize with you, share with you some goals and clear image for a preferable future. And what I want to do in these moments that we have is I want to take you back in order to take you forward to tell you what we said we would do together in 2019 and to share with you what we have accomplished in the last three years, even with two of them being in lockdown, uh, a lot of Zoom calls. How many of you are tired of Zoom calls? How many of you know Zoom calls are here to stay? Yeah, there may be different platforms, but we're living in a digital world, folks. We now have the Metaverse Church taking place around the world as well. And uh, when it came, comes to the past, we talked about a few aspects. The first thing we talked about was we talked about making sure as a movement, we are rediscovering our Pentecostal roots. And back in 2019, we said that what we wanted to do was commission a team of ministers and academics to analyse our statements of belief and their application to today. And the reality is this, is this journey is still on and we're in constant review on that to ensure that we are standing true to our Pentecostal roots as a movement. How many of you know in a few years' time we're going to celebrate 100 years of Assemblies of God? 100 years of the Pentecostal movement here and we are so excited about that. We're already making plans. We're all ready to party and to celebrate and thank God for the last 100 years. But how many of you know God's not finished yet? If he was finished, we wouldn't be here. So he's still got a plan and we're still moving forward and we're still excited about that. But one of the things we've been able to do is we brought prayer and the prophetic really as a focus into our movement through firstly our Ascend Prayer Days. The days. To Pastor Martin and Pastor Esther, we wanna thank you, the church at CLM for hosting these brilliant prayer days that we've had. It's been really remarkable to pray, to hear the voice of God, to get prophetic words coming through the online platforms that you've been sharing with us. It's been incredible. But not only that, we also launched our annual, our first ever annual prophetic day in January this year. We had uh, some of our well-known uh, prophetic ministries within our movement getting together. They prayed, they fasted, they believed God. And we had a day of prophecy in January this year, which has been really, really helpful for us. One of the things we wanna make sure is that we're hearing the prophetic voice of God. We're hearing the prophets among us speak 
the words of God to us to cause us to be aware of what we need to be aware of. We need to have eyes open to where we should run and where maybe we should step back. In some points in our prophetic day, we had words talking about areas that maybe we need to reverse out of, cul-de-sacs that maybe we've got into, but it certainly was an amazing, amazing day. And also one of the things that we've talked about is having an urgency on not just the gifts of the Spirit, because we've been good at that, but also the fruit of the Spirit. And this afternoon session was very much about that. One of the other things that we talked about as well is making sure that we have an honour culture for our older ministers. Really celebrating our older ministers. What does positive integration into church look like for them today? Back in 2019, we had 256 retired ministers and missionaries. In 2022, we have 278 retired ministers and missionaries within our movement. And it's been so wonderful to see how they have been getting engaged with us over the last three years. I want you to know that we keep our retired ministers and missionaries in the loop with information from the National Leadership Centre via email. We invite them to support our other churches through a ministry we call The Expendables. Not that our retired ministers are expendables, but they're the professionals that we send to, to go in and, and uh, there's gold in our retired ministers. And uh, we don't believe that in retiring, we go out to pasture. And we have seen a new lease of life come to many of our retired ministers and the wisdom, the import that they brought to churches and ministries has been incredible. We call all of our retired ministers twice a year from the National Leadership Centre to check in on them to see how they're doing. One of our amazing uh, ladies on staff, Elaine, she spends hours on the phone every week. And to walk past her office and to hear her involved in just some amazing conversations has been wonderful. We wanna thank you, Elaine. We wanna thank everybody involved in making the calls, making it possible so we can care and honour them. Also, we are in the middle of releasing a transition, transitioning leadership document with recommendations for local churches on their responsibilities for retiring ministers. Just because maybe you are retired, we want to ensure that we in our local churches continue to honour you. So what does it look like? You can expect that on the internet for all our ministers very, very soon. And also from this year, we're introducing a lapel pin for all of our retired ministers. All of our retired ministers this week, you will get your lapel pin for your suits, for your blazers, for your jackets, for your leather jackets, Pastor Alan over there, your leather jacket. Not that you're retired, I'm not saying that you are, but you, you can have one anyway because you're cool. I'm gonna move on. And um, for all of our retired ministers, all 278 of them, they're also gonna get them in the post as well as a way of saying thank you so much for everything we want to honour you. So we spent some time looking at the past, but we also three years ago, spend some time looking at the present, some of our current realities. We began to ask some questions like, is the movement enabling churches to grow? I think by 2022, we're able to say, yeah, we believe that our strategic approach is enabling churches to grow in our movement. In 2019, we asked this question, are we able to deal with pastoral grievances and disciplinary issues as they arise both effectively and consistently and the brilliant thing is the professional standards team, the general manager's office are functioning really effectively and consistently in these areas. I wanna honour Pastor Aaron Richardson and everybody in the professional standards team. <laughs> wanna honour our general manager, Pastor Stuart Keir as well, for all they're doing in these areas. It really is a remarkable, a remarkable thing. We asked the question, is Mattersea providing the right environment for us for the training and developing of leaders and ministries? And with your blessing, we initiated two fallow years and then relaunched our brand new Bible college, Missio Day, which launched only in September, just gone. We have 20 BA students, 43 MA students. We have eight applications in progress for 22. We have 30 who have registered interest for later on this year for starting. And we have four more open days to come. You need to know, AOG, we are committed to the development, the training of our pastors and leaders. We have not watered down our academic development and training and development in theology, etc. We have made it work for the day that we live in, the era that we live in. And if ever you have a chance to come to a Missio Day open day, just come and check out the atmosphere, the spirit, the chapel services are truly, truly remarkable. 
We also ask this question, is our Minister in Training program fit for purpose? We currently have in our brand new Ministers in Training program, which runs for three years, we currently have 88 Ministers in Training. We've just accepted another 55 for our brand new cohort, which means we actively right now have 143 Ministers in Training over three years, which is really, really remarkable. We're really excited about that. Back in 2019, we began to speak a little bit about church. In 2019, we had 505 churches. As of 2022, we have 585 churches. 14 are in the application stage on top of that. And we've got seven new live inquiries as well. One of the things I really want you to be aware of is that we are very active in lapsing churches who are not kind of following the guidelines in order to... to be an Assemblies of God church. And part of the reason for that is the risk element that that brings to us as a movement. So pastors and leaders, I really would encourage you that, that when the, the necessary forms are due in, please get on top of that sooner rather than later. And um, we are seeing real good move forward in those areas. We're excited about the journey that we're on with church. One of the things that we raised is this, is that 2019, a common piece of information, a common dialogue that was coming back to us regularly was that larger churches leave the movement stating that the Assemblies of God does not know what to do with the larger churches. In 2022, we're really happy to say we believe we've got a compelling vision and strategy with big thinking and planning, which are encouraging large churches to stay in the movement. Not only that, but we are seeing larger churches joining the movement and also rejoining the movement as well. Churches that have left over the years are coming back in and we are really, really thrilled about that. Also pastors and leaders, you would have seen the email, documentation, it's all on the internet as well, encouraging you tomorrow to ratify the lower and upper limit within the 3%. One of the questions that we've been given over the years is what do ministers get? What do churches get for 3%? And the joke that we're banishing from this year, no more to be said, is this, is you get chased for your 3%. We're not doing that anymore. We're not chasing you anymore. You will be lapsed. And uh, because we're really wanting to really raise the bar, we're, we're wanting to go for a gold standard of church. We're, we're believing that we're a family of churches who want to be together, that we're united behind a strategic vision in a, in a, with a heart's desire to see a nation turn for Jesus. I'm, I'm longing for the day when we see our Assemblies of God people walking the halls of power in Westminster. I'm looking forward to the day when we're seeing our Assemblies of God people growing and representing us in the seven major areas of society. And so we would ask you tomorrow to ratify the, the lower and upper limits on the 3%. You've received the information. We'll talk a little bit more about that as well tomorrow. In 2019, we actually talked about doing a health check. What is the health of Assemblies of God churches in our nation? How healthy are we? We said in 2019, we were gonna put together a church health team and I'm really thankful to tell you that tomorrow, Pastor Grayson Jones will be presenting the strategy on church health. It is very, very, very good. And we are really thrilled. Healthy churches, healthy leaders that will have a healthy impact in our future. And it's such an important thing. We talked about study requisite, you know, skills, characters, qualities needed for an Assemblies of God minister as well. And tomorrow, Pastor Simon will be talking to you about continued professional development. I'm both excited and nervous about continued professional development. But if a doctor needs to do continual professional development, how much more should, can I use this term, doctors of people's souls go on the journey of continued professional development as well. So we're gonna talk about that. In 2019, we had 827 ministers, 586 were in good standing and 241 were not in good standing. Yes. But in 2022, we have 936 ministers, 851 are in good standing and 85 are not in good standing. Just turn to your neighbour, say, uh, I think he's talking about you there. Back in 2019, we talked about reevaluating a few things, reevaluating. We talked about reevaluating our mission statement. And I'm happy to tell you there's been no work done on that yet. I'm sorry about that. 
coronavirus got in the way, but also reevaluate our statements of belief, our statements of belief. The review is pending on that still to ensure that we are staying true to our Pentecostal roots as a movement. We also mentioned in 2019, hey, we're gonna explore the name of the movement. Should we change it? Should we keep it? I wanna let you know that there is no appetite to change the name of the movement, that as I travel around the world, I go to Australia, it's called Australian Christian Churches, but everyone still knows them as the Samples of God Australia. So it seems to work in a global sense and, uh, and so we're, we're really not moving forward on that. We also had a little bit of a conversation regarding church and campus count ideology. Do we count churches? Do we count campuses and locations as separate numbers? I want you to know that we are looking at campus, multi-site, church locations as different numbers within the church count moving forward. That seems to be the trend globally. And also it seems to be the trend where once upon a time people would plant autonomous churches. Now many more churches are going multi-site. And, uh, and we think that's wonderful. So that is included in the way we do our count and what our count looks like. In 2019, we talked about the NMC and Mattacy. And um, thankfully, God has been really good. We were able to sell Mattacy to the wonderful people of Green Pastures. And so in many senses, it's keeping it in the family. And we have new, moved the National Ministry Centre to central Manchester, where we are renting some offices. We're calling it the National Leadership Centre. And we are still on the journey of looking to find the right site in order to purchase and or build. So in the short term, we are still renting. Back in 2019, we began to look at the new NLT and, uh, and having separate area leaders. If you remember, we mentioned that we didn't quite know how the previous NLT did it. They were the board, the NLT and the area leaders and they stayed sane. And I salute them. But back in 2019, we were able to, to differentiate between the NLT, the area leaders, zones and hubs. And we're so thrilled with the way areas, zones and hubs have moved forward. It truly is a remarkable thing. If you lead an area, a zone or a hub, could you quickly stand to your feet in this auditorium right now? Area, zones and hubs. Thank you so much for building our movement from the ground up. Thank you so much for the relational import that you are creating, the relational buy-in. It really is a remarkable, a remarkable thing. And then we also talked about the 3% a moment ago as well. When we stepped into the future, we're still looking back at the moment, but in 2019, we talked about a few things. We talked about some street strategic ways forward. I remember uh, I was sitting in a room in Bradford back in 2018, and uh, it was one of the Assemblies of God national meetings. And I felt God speak to my heart and said, Glenn, if you were gonna do it, what would you do? And so I wrote a triangle effectively or three circles down on my journal and we began to focus on this three years ago together as a movement. The first thing we began to identify is this, is leadership development, leadership development. And leadership development, it's all about having non-silo development of leaders. The whole idea is that in our leadership, if we can just go back one slide, that would be good. Go back a slide, back to leadership development. We talked about the idea that we would begin to identify and train a new generation of leaders in leadership development. And so with our leadership pipeline of Young Lions, MIT, Missio Day, AOG Kids, AOG Youth, and our new program called CPD, Continual Professional Development, we are really, really thrilled with just the way together as a movement we have bought into leadership development. I wanna thank Pastor Simon Jarvis and his team who've done an amazing job in helping us to shape leadership development and uh, the way it looks. And I uh, wanna thank his wife actually, because it's probably, you know. <laughs> the second area we talked about is church health, church health. The creation of a new national ministry that facilitates two things. Number one, healthy pastors and leaders who go the distance healthy pastors and leaders, and secondly, healthy churches. One of the sayings I've heard banded about for many years is this, is healthy things grow. I don't know if I believe that anymore. I, in our last house, we had a box hedge. It was healthy, but it never grew. Things that are healthy renew themselves, refresh themselves, 
develop in some ways. And so even though we are believing as a movement that we will grow in numbers, one of the things I do wanna, uh, a burden I wanna take off many leaders across this place is the pressure to grow numbers in local church. Really, what we're called to do is obey the voice of God. You can be healthy and not grow in numbers and you can be unhealthy and grow in numbers. What we wanna have is healthy leaders and healthy churches. And a lot of the health in terms of our local church comes down to the demographic areas that we find ourselves in. Some of you find yourself in transitional areas where in order to stay the same, you've got to grow by 40% just to keep the same numbers year in, year out. I would say you are a healthy church. But also healthy churches and healthy leaders have a, have a fruit to them that we're gonna to get to in a moment's time. Tomorrow, Pastor Grayson is gonna share on church health and how we can be involved in that and what that looks like for us. And I would encourage every pastor, every leader in this place to really step into the church health side of things. We are really thrilled about it, really thrilled about it. The third area that we talked about is missions. We talked in 2019 about championing, championing a new generation of called out and sent out missionaries. And I'm so thrilled that under Kirk's leadership, 3D Mission GB has got three phases, discover, develop, deploy. And it is so good. It is so insightful, it's so practical. And within it, we have our 3D Missions Conference. We have our Kairos courses course. We have our Chaplaincy Conference. We have our Missions Champions, of which there are 425. We have Missions Forums. And our Missions team are brilliant. They are dedicated and they are as brilliant as are our missionaries. We currently have 79 missionaries on the field, which is 20 less than three years ago because missionaries have to retire from the field at some point too. But I'm not concerned because we are here to discover, develop and deploy a new generation of missionary and a new generation of missional outreach. If you are one of our AOGGB missionaries in the room, could you quickly just stand to your feet? We wanna honour you and celebrate you right now. I know you're here. There's over 30 of you in the room. And while you're standing, stay standing please for a moment. If you are one of our missionaries, come on, stand back up. Don't sit down. The Lord will judge you. If you are one of our Assemblies of God, 104 chaplains, would you also stand up? We wanna honour all of our chaplains across this place. Incredible. Incredible. Thank you so much for all that you're doing. Within the context of our connection with local church, we've created something called Champions. The idea with champions is we have the opportunity in some senses to bypass you, the senior pastor, and talk to somebody in your church who you nominate to represent you on some issues that in some senses may just weigh you down. We currently have 415 missions champions, 410 governance champions. Come on, they need a round of applause right now, don't they? <laughs> Pastors, you should applaud them. They're keeping you out of jail, let me tell you. We have 350 prayer champions. We have 423 safeguarding champions. We have 363 children's champions, 342 youth champions, and 282 champions in young adults and students. And we wanna thank you for all that you are doing within that, amazing. So we look back and we thank God for all that He's done in three years, two years in lockdown. And yet God has been faithful. God has moved us forward as a movement. But last year online, I asked a question to you all. I said, what would it look like? And it was just a, it was a litmus test. It was a seed moment. It was a, a chance to uh, see what sort of appetite was out there. Said, hey, Assemblies of God, what would it look like for us to have a thousand churches in Great Britain? And the chatter feed went ballistic and phones went ballistic and emails went crazy and we're trying to finish the online conference and we're getting distracted with people texting and encouraging and, and writing to us. And, 
There's always been method in our madness over the last three years of leadership development, church health, and mission. And the missing piece is in the middle. And the missing piece, of course, is church planting. Church planting. Now, I want you to know that that in church planting, it is proven, it is proven that church planting is the most effective way to reach a nation. We're talking about churches that are focused on the mission of reaching the lost. Not churches that are focused on keeping people, but churches that are focused on reaching the lost, engaging in the great commission of Christ. Not building numbers of pew warmers, but making disciples. Churches that are developing and releasing more and well-equipped leaders. So for the last three years, there's always been a reason for leadership development, church health and mission. That in leadership development, we recognise the changing seasons, that we have skillful leaders who are cartographers of the world God is shaping. That in church health, healthy churches, healthy leaders, planting and releasing healthy leaders to create healthy churches. And then within mission, mobilising disciples to reach the lost whether the lost are their neighbours or the nations of the world. Currently in Assemblies of God, Great Britain, we have 585 churches, 14 applications in process, and we have seven live inquiries. Beyond that, when we begin to think about Scotland, the wonderful nation of Scotland, led by the brilliant Dr. Ian Duthie, who will be preaching on Saturday, everybody. In Scotland, we have 41 churches, 83 ministers, and how's this? 27 towns of 10,000 people with no Assemblies of God church. Anybody see maybe an opportunity in that? In the land of my fathers, 52 churches, 63 ministers, 23 towns, villages of 15,000 people with no Assemblies of God church. In England, we have 492 churches, 711 ministers, and 48 conurbations of 100,000 people with no Assemblies of God church. If you don't know what conurbation means, ask your neighbour. 585 churches, 936 ministers. I spent about eight months last year drawing up our church planting strategic document and did a lot of reading, a lot of study, a lot of research, a lot of phone calls. In October last year, I was sitting in a room of some quite amazing Pentecostal leaders and the question was asked around the room, Glenn, what's the plans for Assemblies of God moving forward? Do you have a church planting dream and strategy? I said, yeah, I I can tell you, but you can't tell anyone because I haven't talk to the movement yet. And I began to share with them our dream for Assemblies of God, Great Britain, something that I believe and I hope you will buy into from tonight. And there was such an excitement in the room that on the back of that and in and around that time, Assemblies of God Global began to speak to us about something called MM33, His Mandate, Our Mission. And currently around the world in Assemblies of God movements, there are 373,000 Assemblies of God churches. How's this for a crazy dream? They've begun to sow the idea and say, wouldn't it be amazing if by Pentecost 2033, we could have a million churches on the planet? The sharing of that dream coincided with me really finishing our strategic plan for church planting. And when I was able to share what our plans are moving forward to that very small room, they on the back of that have asked the Assemblies of God Great Britain to take the lead in church planting for all of Europe, which means that God has really positioned us as a movement of churches to become a missionary movement again, a church planting movement again. If you remember last year, we, we spoke about, we spoke on three years ago, sorry, we spoke about the fact that in terms of our number of churches between the end of the 1950s and 2019, 
We hadn't grown in our number of churches. We'd seen rises and dips, but overall our number pretty much stayed the same. And yet our Pentecostal roots are church plant, is church planting. You know the stories, I do too. We know the crazy stories of, of, of women who set up churches in their lounge rooms, in railway stations. We know the stories of our heroes of old, the bivocational pastors and leaders who were probably more ill-equipped and more nervous than us. Probably thinking more so that maybe somebody else was better equipped to plant a church than them. And yet they got on with the job of seeing the lost one by planting churches. And so we're really thrilled that from this week moving forward, God has given us the opportunity to help all of the Assemblies of God movements through Europe strategize and plan for what a church planting will look like in their nations. I want you to understand that between now and 2033, that means thousands of new churches. I'm glad four of you are excited about that. How are we gonna do it? Let me give you just a few steps tonight and then we're gonna close with the Word of God and we're gonna pray together. Number one, the first stage for us is to really identify church planting leads. I say leads because we need a church planting lead for Great Britain and we need a church planting lead for Europe. And we're really thrilled because just a few months ago we went out via email and we said, listen, we want you to apply. We want you to think about applying. We had some amazing candidates who came in and did a presentation. They sat in a formal interview. They had coffee with myself. There were board members sitting in the room who were part of the interview process. And we're really thrilled to announce to you tonight that our new church planting lead for Great Britain is none other than Pastor Meshach Manhana. So Pastor Meshach, will you bring your wife? Come up on stage for a moment. We wanna honour you. Come on, church, come on. Assemblies of God, GB, how are we doing? Wow, listen, it's a great honour and a great privilege to be here. Uh, one of the things I'm really excited about can only be described out of 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 16. It's that moment when Elisha is standing side by side with his servant. And the servant is terrified. And Elisha's response is very simple. He says, Lord, open his eyes. And in that moment the vision that the servant begins to see is completely different. His response to what he was seeing became very different. And tonight, I just wonder what would happen across this whole room when our eyes become open to the greater reality in church planting. Over many, many years, over many, many years, church planting has been something that only a few can do. But I wonder what would happen across our movement when men, women, and young people have their eyes open that they too can plant a church. Yes, you can plant a church in Cornwall. Yes, you can plant a church in any village. Yes, you can plant a church in the town. Yes, you can plant a church in the city. If we are gonna see a thousand churches, Pastor Glynn, we need every single one of you. Okay, not only that, when we think about Europe, we're really honoured to welcome onto team to take the lead for us in Europe in terms of uh, connecting with the Assemblies of God superintendents through Europe and their church planting leads. Every country in Europe will set their own goals. They'll develop their own strategies, but we will be working with them to encourage them. So would you please welcome to stage Pastor Adam Islip as he brings his wife Susie up on stage right now. So to let you know, we're so thankful, firstly, for your church in Southampton, Meshach, uh, Charlene, to release you. That's, 
That's a crazy commitment to church planting. And uh, we pr- pray that the church in Southampton just goes from strength to strength to strength. We believe in that, that you know what, the best days of the church are definitely yet to come. And, uh, and that church is going to become a church planting church in Jesus' name. You've got no choice. It's your church. And... Uh, and stuff, and uh, they're moving to Manchester in two weeks, everybody. And uh, so, moving their family, they've got four children. They're going to have another three because a quiver is seven. The Bible says, and that, uh, and um, and not only that, we also want to thank uh, Pastor Derek and Georgina, the Church at King's Church Bolton, for releasing uh, Adam to come and be a part of the team at the National Leadership Centre, taking the lead for us in Europe. Uh, Adam, why don't you just say something to the movement for a moment? Well, I don't know about you listening to Glyn just outlining that vision. My mind was blown. And then when I saw my face, and my mind's blown. <laughs> what an opportunity, what a privilege, and what an honour. And um, if what happens, happens, what an opportunity to be part of it. And so I want to thank the AOG for giving me the opportunity yeah. to be part of it. But if there's one thing true after what Alan said this morning about Jesus building his church. That church was never meant to be stationary. It was meant to be a movement an ever-expanding movement. And so this should be normal. The church should be growing. And I was just thinking when Glyn was sharing then, when it was said of Paul and Silas, when they were trying to find them in the book of Acts, and they dragged out Jason, and they said, we're trying to find Paul and Silas, these men that have turned the world upside down. And when I think of Europe now, and thinking about the, all the opportunities out there to build the church, let's pray that Europe gets turned upside down for Jesus. And then. We should pray for them tonight. Pastor Sean Malarkey, could you come out, Pastor Sean? Pastor Sean Malarkey leaves, uh, leads Assemblies of God in Ireland. It's called Christian Churches Island, but we know it as Assemblies of God Island. So Pastor Sean, why don't you come up and uh, come on over here, Pastor, and uh, reach out your hands towards them, folks, and we are going to spend just a moment blessing them, commissioning them, and praying for them in Jesus' name. Come on, guys, let's uh, just reach out in this direction. I am so excited by what I've seen, but not just by what I've seen, I'm excited about what I'm feeling. You you know, when uh, Mary and Elizabeth got into the same room, there was something that jumped inside. And and I don't know about you, but as things were just being shared, something inside of me leapt and said, this is the time, this is the moment, and these are the people who are going to set an example and lead us, and they're going to, we're going to take this nation and take Europe for Jesus Christ. Come on, let's begin to pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful opportunity of praying over these couples. We thank you, God, that we can truly say that they are in the kingdom for such a time as this. And Father, we pray for divine strategy. We pray for divine strength. We pray for an increase. We pray for a new anointing. We pray for a new anointing to fall on this couple, these couples. We pray that their hearts will be stretched. We pray that their sight will be increased. We pray that their courage will increase. We pray, Lord, that they'd run faster than they've ever run before. We pray that they would climb higher than they've ever climbed before. We pray that their hearts will be so enlarged for the things that you have in store for our nation. We pray for the nation of Great Britain. We pray for Great Britain. We pray for every town. We pray for every city. We pray for every village. We pray for every county. We pray for every groupings of people. We pray, God, for revival. We pray for church growth. We pray for an explosion of revival and evangelism to happen in our nation. For the continent of Europe, we thank you that you have not finished with Europe. We thank you, Lord, that we may be separated by sea, but we're connected by a divine connection. And Father, we pray in this moment of time, as we lay our hands upon them, we release them today, we release them. But Father, what we pray for them, we also pray for us because it's not about them doing it on their own. We stand with them this evening. We're family. We're gonna take this nation. We're gonna take this continent for you. Why? Because we are stronger together. We're more equipped together. And together we can do it. Together we will do it. Together we will not just talk about it. 
we'll not just read about it, but we will see it. We'll not just see it, we will write the books. We will tell the stories and we will see a wave of great breakthrough and an awakening in this nation and the nations of Europe. And we pray this in your wonderful name. We pray this in your wonderful name. Praise you, Lord. Praise you, Lord. Lord, we absolutely all love a good wedding. And Lord, we can see all those brides that are going to be coming, Lord God. Praise the Lord. It's your kingdom, Lord Jesus. And they're beautiful brides, Lord God. And Lord Jesus, we can see that prophetic act, Lord God, at that wedding at Cana, Lord Jesus. And we can see, Lord God, you, Jesus, there, Lord God. Was it a statement that your first miracle would be at a wedding where a bride would be present, Lord God, and you were stating your emotion, Lord God, towards what you would be doing as a movement of the Spirit, Lord God, throughout the world, Lord God. And Lord Jesus, we just want to bless these people, Lord God, who are, Lord God, going to be wooing new brides, Lord God. Hallelujah. Lord God, that are going to be doing something that is just going to take our breath away. The beauty of the new brides we are going to see is going to be amazing. It's going to be something that's going to bring joy and ecstasy, Lord God, even to this continent once again, Lord God, because it's the joy of the Lord that is our strength. Lord Jesus, we want to bless the God who is the master of the banquet, Lord God. Lord Jesus, we want to bless the Lord who's the king of new wine, Lord God. We want to bless the king of kings, hallelujah, who's there full of joy at these wedding celebrations for these new brides. And we want to thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise the Lord. We can see it, Lord. You're opening our eyes to all of these incredible, beautiful new brides, Lord God, that are going to express redemption, Lord God, that are going to bring in the lost, Lord God, that are going to see marriages put back together, that are going to see children brought back to their parents, Lord God, and parents brought back to their children. Where better than in the church of Jesus Christ? What a joy to be part of this. What a joy to be part of this wedding celebration. And Lord God, we look forward to 2033, Lord God, when we will be celebrating all of these beautiful brides that you brought, Lord God, as the master of the banquet. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Come on, one more time. Can we put our hands together for these amazing couples? You can take your seats, folks. The second area is just really, just make sure that as a movement, we're moving forward with an appetite for church planting. Hungry people will do anything for food. If we're hungry for the nation to turn to Jesus... I believe that an appetite will increase in our hearts. Uh, I'm praying, folks, that as you drive home on Saturday night and as you drive around our amazing nation over the next few months, that God will break your heart for communities, that you'll drive through and instead of thinking, thinking somebody else should start something here, that maybe God will break your heart too and you'll think, you know what, these people need a church and maybe you could be the church to do it. I believe you can be. We want to thirdly identify conurbations of 10,000 and above in Wales, 12,000 and above in Scotland, and 100,000 and above in England that have no Assemblies of God Church. We went through a list a moment ago, but the reason for this is because we want to dream as a movement. We want to dream. It doesn't restrict us from planning churches in smaller conurbations of people, not at all, but we want to have an aspirational goal as well in some of those larger areas where it feels like people are ripe for a move of God and ripe for church. Fourthly, one of the things that we want to really be working on in this next season is identifying and selecting church planters. And there are several mechanisms for this in terms of identifying them and And in identifying our church planters, we are gonna have stage goals for church planting over a six year period. Yes, we are. We're gonna bring in a stream of church planting into Missio Day and believe that our students in Bible college will have a heart for church planting. I was in my second year of Bible college and God said to me, you're gonna move to England and you will one day plant a church. My heart was broken as a 22 year old man and it wasn't until maybe being 35 where I had the opportunity to do that, and maybe even my late 20s in multi-site in the church that I had served in, but a word had been sown into my life as a 22-year-old. Through our MIT program, we're believing that as our ministers in training are coming through, that we'll begin to see church planting, the spirit of church planting, the, the spirit of a pioneer of courage rising up within our ministers in training. In Young Lions, 
our 16 to 21 year olds, we're believing that God will do something in young lions, that our young lions will begin to roar like a lion and something will begin to happen there in Jesus' Name. Let me tell you about funding mechanisms. Where do you create the money? Well, I'm so thrilled to tell you that in November 2021, when I sat with the board and shared our heart for church planting and the strategy for church planting, I was so thrilled when the board agreed to set aside 1.5 million pounds for the purpose of church planting in this next season for our movement. Come on, that's amazing. On top of that 1.5 million, since we sanctioned that as a board, in November, another 700,000 pe- pounds, people, pounds from outside external sources has been sowed into our church planting fund. That's 2.2 million pounds. And here's what we're gonna work on with you. We will commit to you to creating a match fund. So as a church planter, if you are planting a new local autonomous church or you are planting a campus or a local um, uh, uh, a location of your church, then for every pound you raise, we will give you a pound up to a maximum of 50,000 pounds. That money will then be, need to be repaid by you interest-free over five years so that we're not just giving away or eating our seed, but the seed is going out to create a harvest that is then coming back into a dedicated fund for somebody else to come and say, I'm planting a church, I wanna create a match fund as well. Listen, that means together as a movement, we will be over the next few years be putting 4.4 million pounds into church planting. Can we give God some praise for that opportunity that we have in this season? I'm nearly there, I'm losing my voice. Number six, the sixth thing is this, is we're gonna have successful examples and models of church planting. We will make these stories readily available, illustrations, successful models, to inspire and equip you. I want you to know that anybody can plant a church. If I can do it, you can do it. If Pastor Lucas Dewhurst can do it, you can definitely do it. And I also want you to know, seventhly, we are going to be working on, as a team, some plug and play models of church planting. We live in a plug and play world. You buy something, you plug it in, you expect it to work. And so we're gonna develop templates that provide church planning models that include step-by-step methodology for pioneering churches in different conurbations and styles. A church planter or a church establishing a new location or campus may adopt these models to make the how of planting a church more accessible. In other words, you don't need to work out what you need to do a year beforehand. We will give you the model. It will explain step by step what it looks like a year before, 10 months before, eight months before, six months before, all the way through up until the weekend you plant. And we wanna stand with you. We don't wanna send you out on your own to go and and try, fingers crossed, hopefully you'll do well. If not, you'll die. No, 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 we're believing. We're believing that together we're gonna plant some great churches. Let me give you a statistic. This is a statistic that I am, Uh, a little bit hesitant to give on the basis that I can't cite it. Evidentially, I can't cite it. But the statistic that is floating around in all of the church planting circles is this. When you plant a church, that new church, if it itself plants a church within three years, then the success of that first church that's been planted is 94%. But if that church that has been planted doesn't plant within three years, its success rate drops to 8%. So what we're talking about, friends, is not just planting churches, but planting churches that plant churches. We've got a whole document on this that we'll make available to you at some point. Maybe I can just give you some goals for a few moments. What do our goals look like? Our church planting goals. MM33, Assemblies of God Global, is focused on the next 11 years, but I wanna focus your attention for the next six years. What could we do together as a movement in the next six years? We're believing that in year one, between now, May this year, and May next year, we will plant together 20 new churches, locations, or campuses in the next 12 months. 
I want you to know that we already have 37 churches who've said to us, we want to be in stage one. So in some senses, we're already ahead of the curve. We just gotta get them started. In year two, we're believing that together as a movement, we will plant 30 churches. In year three, we will plant 60 churches. In year four, anyone scared yet? 80 churches. In year five, 100 churches. And in year six, 110 churches, which makes a goal in the next six years of 400 new Assemblies of God churches. Come on folks, 400 brand new churches, locations, campuses, communities, getting a new Bible believing, Jesus preaching. Community of believers who are faith filled there to reach the community. Our expectation, our expectation is that the first churches planted in the first three years will become part of the number that we'll be planting in the final three years of it because it's churches that plant churches. Over the years, some people have said, listen, how, what do you put, you know, some of the perceived, however you define that success of audacious and hands down, one of the greatest things we did 14 months into the life of our church was we planted a church into Krakow in Poland. The opportunity came available, the right people. And for eight months, I think it was, we flew out teams every Saturday night from Manchester who did church on Sunday morning in Krakow, jump on a plane Sunday afternoon, come back to Manchester in our church in the evening and talk about what happened in church that morning. That church, this is now 12 years later, that church currently is housing 1,000 refugees from the Ukraine. Mums, daughters and sons under the age of 16. Churches that plant churches. I want you to know it's gonna be an exciting journey. It's a nerve wracking journey. I believe we can do it. I believe we can do it. I believe, I've got the faith. I know I've been living with this for three years and I know I've been working on our strategic plan that I put in Pastor Meshach and Pastor Adam's hand. They've only been on staff two days, folks. I said, here's the document, here's the plan, here's what I want you to work on. Here's what the next six years are gonna look like. Pastor Ian Duffy, Pastor Denise Kagenvin, Pastor Roy Morley, the countries are gonna set targets. They're gonna identify working with Meshach in this country. They're gonna identify the location. Sometime I hope you can come to Manchester and just come to the National Leadership Centre and just stand for an hour in front of the map of Great Britain. You'll see where our churches are. And you'll go, you mean we haven't got a church there? Or uh, is it true we only have two churches in North Yorkshire? Wow. What an opportunity. And of course, I know we have other wonderful movements and, and, and we bless them, don't we? We bless them. We bless the Church of England. We, we bless the Archbishop Justin Welby. The first time I met him, he said, what's the name of your church? I said, my, my church is called Audacious Church. He goes, that's a bit arrogant, isn't it? I said, says you, the Church of England. <laughs> he said, good point. But there's a move of God in the Anglican Church. Did you know that? And we thank God for that. And we're not, we're not competing. We're not, we're not competing for souls. Our areas, our zones, our hubs are gonna work with this. This is gonna work through all levels. We're, we're gonna set our goals together. We're gonna, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're gonna work on this together. And so I wanna encourage you, let's, let's plant some churches. It's so exciting. It's so exciting to to rock up and not know who's gonna be there. And you know, don't you, that, that when you plant a church, every crazy from every other church is gonna come. You know that? I keep saying to our church, you know, small groups have two stages, awkward or awesome. There's no in between. So if you can hang on for the awkward, going to get awesome. And we're taking off the pressure of numbers. 
But you imagine if we had 400 new churches of a thousand new, like a hundred people in every one of those churches. Like that. 50? Talking about tens of thousands of believers, folks. Four hundred new churches. Someone planted the church you got saved in. You may know not them, not know their name, and you may not know their story. But there was a moment when they were praying and they were reading their Bible. There, there was a moment when they were maybe in a conference. Maybe they were. I don't know where they were, but there was a moment. Someone planted the church my dad got saved in, in Risker in South Wales. That green hut on the side of the hill. And he got saved out of a communistic household. Someone planted his church. I don't want you to think church planting, I want you to think souls. Let's, let's just maybe stop thinking small for a moment, me included. Let's stop thinking our local community. Let's think a nation. It's one thing to disciple people, but what would it look like to disciple a nation? What, what would it look like for us collectively to have, to have a movement so, so united? Are we different? Yeah, we're different. And leading Assemblies of God is way different to leading my local church. I get that. But to be so united in vision. How can our Prime Minister ignore us any longer? Because we represent tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands. Millions? I don't know, I love what Pastor Allen said this morning, the Gospel still works. It's His presence is still wonderful. You know those moments where you just Go back a slide, huh? Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. Have we got it there? Ezekiel twenty-two thirty. I looked. His eyes are roaming, searching to and fro, looking. I look for someone who, among them, who will build up a wall and stand before me in the gap on behalf of the land. So I would not have to destroy it. But I found none. You know the symbology, don't you? The, the big walls, it's, we see it in Lord of the Rings, Helm's Deep. The enemy attacks that one part of the wall. There's a breach in the wall and the breach in the wall, the enemy can invade. And yet the defenders know just one man can stand in the gap. There's a wall on one side and a wall on the other and there may be a breach here, but I will stand in the gap. And the enemy can't get around me because there's a wall. The enemy can try to get through me, but even if he gets through me, there's a whole army behind me. It may be said tonight that God, He looked and He found some. So Lord, I'll stand in the gap on behalf of my nation on behalf of my people, on behalf of the people who live in the towns, the cities, the villages, the hamlets. As I drive through Scotland and I drive through these little areas, you kind of wonder, where's the church? And we have placed an unrealistic pressure on the need to have large numbers in church, which the Bible doesn't speak about. And we place unrealistic expectations that say you have to be full time, which the Bible doesn't speak about. We are people who are farmers Monday to Saturday, but church planters on Sunday. 
policemen through the week, but preaching the gospel on a Sunday. Small groups beginning to populate, spring up all around the place. So come on, if you're not on your feet, why don't you stand to your feet across this place? Thank you for tuning in with us wherever you are. To find out more about Assemblies of God Great Britain and for more information about our upcoming events, please visit aoggb.com. 